Hello everyone. Before we start today's content, I would like to share some sad news regarding the channel. The monetization of the channel has been rejected, which has greatly disappointed me. Therefore, I might stop at this point and start publishing again on another channel, because this channel has died due to lack of channel promotion, citing two previous copyright violations. So the solution is a new channel and a new spirit. I'm waiting for your comments. Will I find support from you on the new channel? That's all. Let's begin. The rhythmic crunch of gravel under our tires signaled our arrival at the familiar lakeside cabin. As I stepped out of the car, the scent of pine and fresh water filled my lungs, instantly transporting me to a world away from the bustling city life we'd left behind. It was late July, and our monthly family gathering at the lake had grown into something larger this time around. Our cabin, a weathered wooden structure that had stood the test of time and countless family memories, seemed to welcome us with open arms. Its wraparound porch, adorned with mismatched rocking chairs, creaked softly as we unloaded our gear. The late afternoon sun cast long shadows across the yard, where my younger cousins were already engaged in an impromptu game of tag. Inside, the cabin was a hive of activity. Aunts and uncles bustled about, unpacking groceries and debating dinner plans. The living room, with its stone fireplace and well-worn leather sofas, quickly filled with laughter and animated conversations. It was clear that this weekend would be one for the books. As the youngest of the older kids, I found myself in a unique position, too old to join the little ones in their games, yet not quite ready to settle into the adult conversations, I gravitated towards my siblings and their friends. My older brother, a college sophomore with an easy smile and a penchant for adventure, was already discussing sleeping arrangements with his girlfriend. My younger brother, all gangly limbs and nervous energy, hovered nearby, eager to be included. It didn't take long for us to realize that the sleeping situation inside the cabin would be tight. With a mischievous glint in his eye, my older brother suggested we pitch a tent on the beach. The idea was met with enthusiasm by our little group, and after a quick okay from our parents, we set about making it happen. The beach was a thin strip of sand that separated the grassy lawn from the lake's edge. It wasn't much, but it was ours. As we hammered tent stakes into the sand, I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement. This was freedom, even if it was just a few yards from the cabin. As the sun began to set, Casting a palette of oranges and pinks across the sky, the smell of grilled burgers and corn on the cob wafted from the cabin's small kitchen. We gathered on the porch, paper plates balanced precariously on our laps, savoring the simple meal and the company of family. Stories were shared, jokes were told, and plans were made for the days ahead. After dinner, as the younger kids were ushered off to bed, we older ones gravitated towards the fire pit. My uncle, a master storyteller, regaled us with tales of his youth spent on this very lake. He spoke of midnight swims, of fish so big they nearly capsized his boat, and of the ghostly loon calls that echoed across the water on still nights. As the fire died down to embers and the mosquitoes became more persistent, we retreated to our tent. The air mattresses squeaked beneath us as we settled in hushed giggles and whispered conversations filling the darkness. Through the mesh of the tent, I could see the stars twinkling brightly, unobscured by city lights. The gentle lapping of waves against the shore provided a soothing backdrop, and soon we drifted off to sleep. I'm not sure how long I had been asleep when I was jolted awake by an unfamiliar sound. At first, I thought it might be the wind or perhaps a large fish jumping in the lake. But as I lay there, fully alert now, I realized it was the low hum of a boat engine. Fishing at night wasn't uncommon on our lake. In fact, some of the best catches were said to happen under the cover of darkness. But something about this particular engine sound set me on edge. It was too close, far closer than any respectful fisherman would venture to the shoreline at night. I nudged my older brother awake, whispering urgently about the strange noise. He listened for a moment, his brow furrowing in confusion. 
Without a word, we carefully extricated ourselves from our sleeping bags, trying not to wake the others. The night air was cool against my skin as we unzipped the tent and stepped out onto the beach. The moon, nearly full, cast an eerie glow across the water. We made our way to the dock, our bare feet silent on the wooden planks. What we saw next is something I'll never forget. A fishing boat, its engine humming quietly, was drifting slowly past our property. But what made my breath catch in my throat was the fact that the boat appeared to be completely empty. We stood, rooted to the spot, as the ghostly vessel continued its eerie journey. The moonlight glinted off its metal surface, creating an almost ethereal glow. As we watched, the gentle waves gradually guided the boat towards our neighbor's beach. The silence of the night was suddenly shattered by a cacophony of barks. Our neighbor's dog, a large German shepherd named Max, had obviously sensed something amiss and was raising the alarm. Within seconds, our own dogs joined in, their barks echoing across the water. Startled into action, my brother and I hurried back down the dock. We were about to head up the hill to the cabin when movement caught my eye. From the inky shadows of our neighbor's property, a figure emerged. My heart leapt into my throat as I took in the surreal sight. The figure was clad entirely in black, a wetsuit clinging to their form. Their face was obscured by a mask and goggles, giving them an otherworldly appearance. Time seemed to slow as the figure sprinted past us, no more than 90 feet away. Despite the warm summer night, I felt a chill run through my body. The figure moved with purpose, making a beeline for the previously empty boat. In a matter of seconds, the mysterious intruder had boarded the vessel and fired up the engine. As the boat began to pull away from the shore, the figure turned towards us. Even from a distance, I could feel their gaze upon us standing frozen on the beach. Then, in a spray of water, they were gone, disappearing into the vastness of the lake. My brother and I stood in stunned silence for what felt like an eternity. The dogs continued to bark, but it seemed distant, as if coming from another world. Eventually, we gathered our wits enough to return to the tent, though sleep eluded us for the rest of the night. As the first light of dawn began to creep across the sky, we heard commotion from the direction of our neighbor's cabin. Voices raised in alarm, car doors slamming, and the unmistakable wail of approaching sirens broke the morning stillness. We emerged from our tent to find the adults already gathered on the porch, looks of concern etched on their faces. Our neighbor, Mr. Johnson, was pacing back and forth, gesticulating wildly as he spoke to a police officer. It didn't take long for the story to emerge. The Johnson's cabin had been broken into during the night. The intruder had managed to disable their security system and had been in the process of gathering valuables when Max, their loyal German shepherd, had raised the alarm. The burglar had fled empty-handed, but the sense of violation was palpable. As my brother and I recounted what we had witnessed, the gravity of the situation began to sink in. The police listened intently, jotting down notes and exchanging significant looks. They praised us for our observance, but cautioned us against taking any risks in the future. Next time, the officer said gravely, call 911 immediately. The rest of the day passed in a blur of police interviews, concerned phone calls from relatives who had heard the news, and hushed conversations among the adults. The carefree atmosphere of the previous evening had evaporated, replaced by a tense vigilance. As night fell once again, no one suggested sleeping in the tent. Instead, we crowded into the cabin, doors locked and windows secured. Sleep came fitfully, if at all, for most of us. The next few days saw a flurry of activity around the lake. Additional security measures were discussed and implemented. Motion sensor lights were installed and a neighborhood watch program was hastily organized. The once peaceful lakeside community had been shaken to its core. As the weekend drew to a close and we prepared to return to our everyday lives, I couldn't shake the feeling that something fundamental had changed. The lake, once a symbol of carefree summer days and family togetherness, now held a hint of danger. 
a reminder that the outside world could intrude even here. In the weeks and months that followed, life gradually returned to normal. We continued our monthly visits to the cabin, but there was an undercurrent of caution that hadn't existed before. The younger children were no longer allowed to roam freely after dark, and midnight swims became a thing of the past. The incident became something of a legend among our family and friends. Each retelling seemed to add new details, the danger becoming more immediate, the escape more narrow. My brother and I found ourselves at the center of these tales, our roles shifting from scared witnesses to heroic observers who had thwarted a master criminal. As for me, I found myself drawn more and more to the water's edge as night fell. I would stand on the dock, watching the moonlight dance on the gentle waves, half expecting to see that mysterious boat drift by once more. It never did, of course, but the memory of that night remained vivid in my mind. In time, the fear faded, replaced by a sense of wonder at the mysteries that lurk in the shadows of even the most familiar places. Our lakeside cabin, once a simple retreat, had become a place of legend, its history enriched by our midnight encounter. Years have passed since that summer night and much has changed. The cabin has been renovated and expanded, the old tent long since replaced by a sturdy boathouse. The younger generation now brings their own children to enjoy the lake, creating new memories and traditions. But still, on quiet nights when the moon is full and the lake is like glass, I find myself remembering. I think about the figure in the wetsuit, the empty boat drifting by, and the way a single night can alter our perceptions forever. Our family still gathers at the lake, drawn by the bonds of kinship and the allure of this special place. We still share meals and laughter, still create new memories with each visit. But always, as the sun dips below the horizon and the first stars appear in the sky, there is a moment of quiet reflection. A moment where we remember that night in late July, when the boundary between the ordinary and the extraordinary blurred, leaving us with a story that would be told and retold for generations to come. And sometimes, in the deepest part of the night, when the loons call hauntingly across the water and the wind whispers through the pines, I wonder, I wonder about the person in the wetsuit, about their story and what drove them to such desperate acts. I wonder if they ever think about that night, about the two young people they encountered on the beach. And I wonder if, like me, they were forever changed by our brief, silent encounter under the summer moon. Years ago, when I was in my prime, I found solace in the great outdoors of California. Camping was my escape, a way to shed the constraints of city life and immerse myself in nature's embrace. Almost every other weekend, I'd pack up my gear and hit the road, seeking new adventures in the wilderness. My love for camping was matched only by my distaste for sleeping on the hard ground. After countless nights of tossing and turning in a tent, I decided to invest in a small camper that attached to the bed of my truck. It was a game changer, a cozy sanctuary that could comfortably accommodate me and a companion if needed. One crisp autumn Friday, I set out on a journey that would forever change my perspective on solo camping. I had chosen a destination about five hours from home, a pristine area I had yet to explore. The drive was long but scenic, winding through golden hills and dense forests. As I navigated the twisting roads, my anticipation grew with each passing mile. I arrived at my destination in the early afternoon, eager to make the most of the remaining daylight. The area was breathtaking, a tapestry of towering redwoods, crystal clear streams, and wildflower dotted meadows. I parked my truck at a trailhead and set out on a challenging hike, my boots crunching on the leaf strewn path. The trail snaked its way up a mountain, offering glimpses of the vast wilderness below. I paused often to catch my breath and marvel at the view, feeling a sense of accomplishment with each step. After a few hours of steady climbing, I reached the summit, 
where I was rewarded with a panoramic vista that stretched for miles in every direction. I sat on a sun-warmed rock, munching on trail mix and drinking in the beauty around me. As the sun began its descent, I made my way back down the mountain, my legs burning pleasantly from the exertion. Near the base of the trail, I stumbled upon a secluded lake, its surface a mirror reflecting the fiery colors of the sunset. Unable to resist, I shed my hiking boots and waded into the cool water, letting it soothe my tired feet. I lingered by the lake until twilight, watching as the first stars began to twinkle in the darkening sky. It was then that I decided to find a spot to camp for the night. I drove my truck up a winding dirt road, searching for the perfect location. After about 20 minutes, I found an ideal clearing, elevated enough to provide a stunning view of the valley below, yet sheltered by a grove of ancient trees. I parked my truck and set about making my home for the night. The camper was a marvel of efficiency, with every inch of space utilized to its fullest. I unfolded the tiny kitchenette and prepared a simple dinner of canned soup and crackers, savoring the taste of a warm meal after a day of physical exertion. As night fell in earnest, I settled into my cozy bed with a paperback novel and a battery-powered lantern. The silence of the wilderness was broken only by the occasional hoot of an owl or the rustle of wind through the trees. It was in these moments that I felt most at peace, far removed from the chaos of everyday life. I must have been reading for an hour or so when I first heard it, the unmistakable sound of footsteps crunching on gravel. At first I dismissed it as my imagination, or perhaps a small animal foraging nearby, but as the sounds grew closer and more distinct, I felt a prickle of unease run down my spine. In all my years of camping, I had rarely encountered other people in such remote locations, especially after dark. I closed my book and held my breath, straining my ears to catch any further sounds. The footsteps continued, slow and deliberate, circling my truck. My heart began to race as I considered my options. Should I call out, pretend to be asleep, make a run for it? Before I could decide, a raspy voice broke the silence. Hello there, it called, the words seeming to hang in the still night air. I just wanted to check out your camper. Pretty nifty. I swallowed hard, my mouth suddenly dry. The voice sounded male with an odd lilting quality that set me on edge. Summoning my courage, I called back, trying to keep my voice steady. Hi, I said louder than necessary. I appreciate your interest, but it's late. I'd be happy to show you the camper in the morning if you're camping nearby. There was no immediate response, just an eerie silence that seemed to stretch on forever. Then I heard muttering, low and indistinct, but clearly coming from just outside my camper. I couldn't make out the words, but the tone sent chills down my spine. I tried to return to my book, hoping that whoever was out there would take the hint and leave, but the footsteps didn't retreat. Instead, they began to move around my truck, slow and purposeful. I could hear them crunching on the gravel, pausing occasionally before continuing their circuit. My camper had small, porthole-like windows on each side, covered with curtains for privacy. With trembling hands, I peeled back one of the curtains just a fraction, peering out into the darkness. The moon had risen, casting a pale light over the clearing, but I couldn't see anyone. The footsteps had moved to the front of my truck, out of my line of sight. I was debating whether to turn on my exterior lights when I heard it, a soft thump on the hood of my truck. My blood ran cold as I realized what was happening. Whoever was out there had climbed onto my vehicle and was now crawling across the roof towards the camper. Anger flared within me, momentarily overshadowing my fear. I took pride in my truck, meticulously maintaining it, and the thought of some stranger damaging it infuriated me. Without thinking, I shouted out, my voice echoing in the quiet night. Hey, I have a firearm in here, I warned, trying to sound more confident than I felt. If you don't get off my truck and leave right now, I'm coming out with my gun. The thumping on the roof ceased immediately, followed by the sound of someone scrambling off the vehicle. I heard footsteps retreating, but they didn't fade away completely. 
Whoever it was hadn't left the area. My heart pounding, I reached for the small safe where I kept my firearm. With shaking hands, I entered the combination and retrieved the gun, along with a powerful flashlight. I took a deep breath, steeling myself for what I might find outside. Slowly, I opened the camper door and climbed out, my eyes darting around the clearing. I swept the flashlight in a wide arc, its beam cutting through the darkness. At first, I saw nothing but trees and underbrush. Then a movement caught my eye. About 40 feet away, crouched near a large bush, was a figure. As my flashlight illuminated him, I caught a glimpse of wild eyes and unkempt hair before he backed further into the shadows. Was this some drug-addled wanderer? A dangerous criminal? Or simply a lost soul with no sense of boundaries? Regardless of his reasons, I had had enough. Leave now, I shouted, my voice carrying across the clearing. Don't come back or I'll call the authorities. The figure retreated further into the darkness, but I could still sense his presence. He hadn't gone far. A wave of exhaustion washed over me as the adrenaline began to subside. I was supposed to drive home in the morning anyway, and there was no way I could sleep peacefully here now. With one eye always on the surrounding forest, I quickly packed up my belongings and secured the camper. Every rustle of leaves, every snapping twig made me jump. As I climbed into the driver's seat, I caught movement in my peripheral vision, the figure still lurking at the edge of the clearing. I started the engine, its rumble shattering the night silence. As I began to drive away, my headlights swept across the area where I had last seen the man. For a brief moment, I saw him clearly. Gaunt face, matted beard, clothes hanging in tatters. But it was his eyes that haunted me, wide and gleaming with an unsettling intensity. As I navigated the winding road back to civilization, my mind raced with questions. Who was that man? What did he want? What might have happened if I hadn't been prepared? The what-ifs plagued me for miles, until the first signs of dawn began to lighten the sky. I stopped at a 24-hour diner just off the highway, desperately in need of coffee and a moment to collect myself. As I sat in a worn vinyl booth, hands wrapped around a steaming mug, I reflected on the night's events. The encounter had shaken me, but it had also reinforced the importance of being prepared and trusting one's instincts. In the years that followed, I continued to camp, but never again with the same carefree attitude. I became more cautious, more aware of my surroundings. I invested in better security measures for my camper and always made sure someone knew my exact location and expected return time. That night in the California wilderness, taught me a valuable lesson about the unpredictability of human nature and the importance of self-reliance. While I never again encountered anything quite as unsettling, the memory of those footsteps in the dark, that raspy voice and those gleaming eyes stayed with me. As I sit here now, years removed from that night, I can't help but wonder about the man in the forest. Was he simply a lonely soul seeking connection in all the wrong ways? Or was there something more sinister at play? I'll never know for certain, but I'm grateful for the wake-up call it provided. For those who venture into the wilderness, whether for a weekend or a lifetime, remember this. Nature's beauty is unparalleled, but it's not without its dangers, both natural and human. Stay alert, trust your instincts, and always be prepared. The wilderness can be a place of solace and adventure, but it demands respect and caution in equal measure. As for me, while I may not camp as frequently as I once did, I still find solace in nature. But now, when I gaze up at the star-filled sky or listen to the wind whisper through the trees, I do so with a heightened awareness of the thin line between solitude and isolation, between peace and vulnerability. That night in California may have changed me, but it didn't break my spirit or my love for the outdoors. Instead, it taught me to appreciate the beauty around me while never forgetting the importance of vigilance. And in the end, isn't that what true wilderness experience is all about? Finding the balance between awe and awareness, between freedom and caution? 
So to all the solo campers out there, I say this, embrace the adventure, revel in the solitude, but never forget that in the vast wilderness, you are not always alone. And sometimes it's the unseen presence that leaves the most lasting impression. The old clock on the wall of the ranger station ticked steadily, its rhythmic sound barely audible over the crackling of the fire. Outside, the spring night was chilly, a reminder that winter's grip hadn't fully loosened yet. But inside, gathered around the fireplace, we were warm and comfortable. I leaned back into the soft leather couch, my eyes drifting from the dancing flames to my fellow rangers. There were four of us on duty that night, me, Harland, Anthony, and Craig. We'd been chatting idly for hours, our conversation meandering from topic to topic as the night wore on. It was one of those quiet shifts where nothing much happened, leaving us free to talk and joke around. These late nights were my favorite part of being a park ranger. There was something special about being out here in the middle of the woods, surrounded by nature but tucked away in our cozy station. It reminded me of camping trips from my childhood, huddled around a fire, telling stories. Except now, instead of a campfire, we had a fireplace, and instead of sleeping bags, we had comfortable leather couches. The station itself was a testament to both function and comfort. Built decades ago from sturdy logs, it had withstood countless storms and seasons. The interior walls were adorned with maps of the surrounding forest, educational posters about local wildlife, and the occasional mounted trophy from bygone hunting days. A large desk dominated one corner, covered in paperwork and radios, while a kitchenette occupied another. But the heart of the station was undoubtedly the fireplace where we now sat. I glanced out the window where darkness had settled upon the woods with its usual silent thoroughness. During the day, this place was a park, full of hikers, picnickers, and nature enthusiasts. But at night, it transformed. The cheerful sounds of visitors faded away, replaced by the mysterious rustling of nocturnal creatures and the whisper of wind through the trees. It wasn't a park anymore. It was the woods, wild and unpredictable. Craig had just finished regaling us with a story about his cousin's recent wedding, a tale that involved a runaway ring bearer, a cake disaster, and an impromptu bagpipe performance. We were all still chuckling when Anthony turned to Harland, our most senior ranger. Hey, Harland, Anthony said, his voice curious. You've been working here longer than any of us. What's the scariest thing you've ever experienced on the job? It was a question we'd asked Harland before. Usually, he'd just chuckle and deflect, saying he'd heard some crazy things over the years, but nothing too scary. But this time was different. Harlan's weathered face grew serious, the laugh lines around his eyes deepening as he furrowed his brow. The Witch of Blackthorn Creek, he said, his voice low and grave. The change in Harlan's demeanor was immediate and palpable. We all fell silent, our attention completely focused on him. Harlan wasn't just our senior colleague. He was the ranger we all looked up to, the one we deferred to when things got tough. His family had been in this area for generations, their roots as deep as the oldest trees in the forest. If anyone had stories to tell about this place, it was Harland. Moreover, Harland wasn't the type to exaggerate or make things up for effect. He was straightforward, hardworking, and always ready to lend a hand when needed. So when someone like Harland tells you he's got a story like that, with a tone of voice that's dead serious, and without a trace of amusement, you listen, and you listen intently. The Witch of Blackthorn Creek, Harlan began again, his clear voice cutting through the silence that had fallen over the room. It's a story I first heard from my Uncle George, who was a lumberjack for many years. According to him, people used to say there was a curse on this land, placed here by a witch. Harlan paused his eyes distant as if seeing something beyond the warmly lit room. We waited, hardly daring to breathe as he collected his thoughts. It all started one year when the harvest went bad, he continued. 
Now you have to understand, this area had always been known for its plentiful harvests. Year after year, the crops would come in bountiful and healthy. So when suddenly there was barely enough grain to get through the winter, people got suspicious. It didn't help that the town had been going through some financial difficulties recently. What had once been a prosperous community was starting to struggle. I shifted in my seat, feeling a chill that had nothing to do with the temperature outside. Harlan's words painted a vivid picture of a town on edge, its people growing increasingly paranoid as their fortunes turned. Then, Harlan went on, strange things started happening. Houses would burn down for no apparent reason. People would go missing, never to be found again. And every now and then, someone would find something odd left near where a person had vanished. Creepy things, like weird-looking dolls made from wood. The kind of thing that would rattle even the toughest person. Anthony let out a low whistle. That's messed up, he murmured. Harlan nodded grimly. It gets worse. See, there wasn't anyone in town that people thought capable of doing these things. But one of the families in town had experienced something similar in a different town many years ago. They started talking about curses and witchcraft. And when a few people who'd been keeping track of all these strange events realized they all took place on a full moon, well, you can imagine how that fueled the paranoia. He paused to take a sip of his coffee, which must have gone cold by now. None of us moved to refill our own mugs. We were too engrossed in the story. It all came to a head, Harlan continued, when there was a terrible accident at the town lumber mill. A fire broke out and no one could figure out how it started. Several employees died, many others were badly injured, and the mill, which was one of the biggest employers around, had to close down. That was when all the fear and paranoia that had been bubbling under the surface for years finally boiled over. I could almost see it in my mind's eye. A town gripped by fear, people whispering in the streets, neighbors eyeing each other with suspicion. It was a far cry from the peaceful community I knew today. So when some people from town found an abandoned cottage in the woods near Blackthorn Creek, Harlan said, his voice growing quieter, forcing us to lean in to hear him. With weird symbols written on the walls and floor, they didn't hesitate. They grabbed their torches, set the place on fire, and watched it burn. He shook his head slowly. According to the stories, that cabin took forever to burn, much longer than anyone thought possible. But once it finally did burn down, they took the ashes and buried them deep in the woods. They didn't mark the location, hoping that would be the end of it. Did it work? Craig asked, his voice barely above a whisper. Harlan shrugged. For a while, it seemed to. But every once in a while, something would happen that would make people in town look over their shoulders. Nothing major. A bit of bad luck in the form of an injury or some suspicious noises outside the house after dark. Maybe some scratch marks on the door or the wall. But ever since then, people would be very careful what they did, especially if there was a full moon. He fell silent then, staring into the fire. The flames danced in his eyes, casting flickering shadows across his face. For a moment, none of us spoke. The only sounds were the crackling of the fire and the ticking of the clock. Finally, Harlan stirred, as if coming out of a trance. I couldn't tell you how old I was when I first heard that story, he said, his voice thoughtful. But I remember exactly how I felt, confused, because the story, although creepy and entertaining, didn't quite make sense to me. And I said something to Uncle George about that. A small smile tugged at the corners of Harlan's mouth. He laughed, said he agreed that the story was long on atmosphere and short on believability. That's when he got serious. Told me that although the story was a bit of fiction, he never doubted that it came from somewhere, and there was indeed something going on out in these woods. Harlan's eyes swept over each of us in turn, his gaze intense. Then he added something I've never forgotten. He said it didn't matter how old I was, where I was, who I was with, or what was going on. If I got a terrible feeling, I should listen to it. 
and I've listened to every feeling I've gotten since then. It's never served me wrong. I felt a shiver run down my spine. I'd had those feelings before out in the woods, that sense of being watched, of something not quite right. I'd always brushed them off as imagination. Now I wasn't so sure. I've never quite believed that witch story, Harland continued, but I will be the last person to deny that in all the years I've been out here, I've felt things on occasion, things that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. And on even fewer occasions, I've seen things, fleeting glances at things that I wasn't sure I saw. He leaned forward, his elbows resting on his knees. But there was one time when I not only felt something, I heard something. The air in the ranger station seemed to grow still. I glanced at Anthony and Craig, seeing my own mix of fascination and unease mirrored in their faces. It was about 30 years ago, Harland explained, his voice taking on a distant quality, as if he was no longer fully in the room with us. I was just starting out as a park ranger. This was back in the early 90s when technology and life in general was very different from today. I'd grown up out in nature, and I'd seen plenty of scary movies, and more importantly, I'd grown up hearing countless spooky stories about what may or may not have been lurking outside, so I wasn't exactly sheltered. But there are some things you're never truly prepared to experience. The fire in the fireplace popped loudly, making us all jump. We were so absorbed in Harlan's story, we had almost forgotten where we were. I glanced at the fire, noting absently that there was still plenty of wood. We wouldn't need to add more for a while. It was early November, Harlan continued. Halloween had just ended, which made everyone sad because I remember that year was a particularly fun one. Darkness seemed to be arriving earlier and earlier, so I was barely halfway through my shift when the sun was going down. I remember it had been raining almost every day, so the days were all gray and cloudy and the nights were damp with plenty of fog. I could picture it clearly, the gloomy days, the misty nights, the kind of weather that seems to blur the line between reality and imagination. But that particular morning was dry, Harlan said. All the leaves that had clung to the trees had been scattered by the winds and rain, so they lay there on the grass, all damp and torn. My job on that particular day was to go around raking them up so they didn't completely cover the trails and paths that people walked on. He shivered slightly, as if feeling a phantom chill. The chill in the air was that chill only late fall can bring, the dampness that seems to soak into your skin and never let go. I had just finished one section of the park and was walking back to my truck when the rain started up again, and it did so with a fury. Harlan's words painted a vivid picture. I could almost feel the cold rain, hear it pattering on leaves and drumming on the roof of a ranger truck. So I hustled it to the truck, got inside, and headed back to the ranger station where I planned to spend the rest of the evening, Harlan continued. And since it was a quiet night at the ranger station, it looked like I would get what I wanted. I was used to working the late shift by myself as the night supervisor, so being alone didn't bother me. I'd always been a quiet type who liked to read a book, so it was an ideal situation for me, except for that night. He took a deep breath before continuing, as if stealing himself for what came next. Because Halloween was over and the rain had been steady, the park hadn't received as many visitors as it usually had. But I was inside the ranger station, this ranger station, in fact, which was just as cozy and warm as you see it now. Plus, now that I was done with my task, I was free to read a book, so I wasted no time in curling up by the fire with a paperback. I looked around the station, trying to imagine it as it was 30 years ago. The basics would have been the same. The fireplace, the desk, the maps on the walls. But there would have been no computers, no cell phones, just a landline and a radio for emergencies. I'd spent many a shift this way, and it was fine by me, Harlan said. I'd happily read a book on a nice day, but on a rainy day, nothing better. Eventually, I started to get hungry. Since I'd just brought a light snack, but turned out to be craving something bigger, I decided to order pizza. 
There was a local joint that was only a few minutes away that often delivered out here back then, so I didn't hesitate to give them a call. I ordered a medium pizza with pepperoni, and as I hung up, the rain started to really pound heavily on the station roof. Harlan's voice took on a quieter tone, as if he was sharing a secret. I knew from experience that the rain pounding on the station roof could truly be loud. It seemed to surround you from all sides. I nodded, knowing exactly what he meant. On rainy nights, the sound of water drumming on the roof could be almost deafening. But by the time the headlights pulled into the driveway, Harlan continued, the rain had faded to a slight drizzle, but I could see the grass leading up here was pretty well soaked, and there were numerous small puddles on both the grass and the road. The trees were swaying along with the winds, and the sky was getting darker by the minute as night was settling in. By now, the outdoor lights had started to switch on as the car from the pizza place pulled up in front of the station, its windshield wipers going back and forth as it stopped in front of the entrance. Harlan's description was so detailed, I could almost see the scene unfolding before my eyes. The wet grass gleaming under the outdoor lights, the pizza delivery car with its wipers still swishing back and forth, the darkening sky above. I stood in front of it, under the part of the roof that kept me out of the rain, Harlan said. The driver, a young guy named Derek in his early twenties, got out of the driver's seat and grabbed the pizza from the passenger's side. Derek had delivered here before, and he'd always done a great job. We chit-chatted as I handed him the cash with a generous tip. Then Derek handed me the pizza and was just about to go back to his car before he stopped and stared at something behind me. Harlan paused, his eyes distant as if seeing that moment replayed before him. He paused and said that it would probably sound crazy, but it looked like there was a woman lurking in the woods near the ranger station. We all sat there silently for a moment, the weight of Harlan's words hanging in the air. I felt a chill run down my spine, and I saw Anthony and Craig shift uncomfortably in their seats. I remember just standing there when he told me, Harland continued, his voice barely above a whisper. The words sounded almost foreign as Derek said them out loud. My first reaction was that it was impossible, but there was only one way to find out, so I turned behind me to look at where he was pointing. He took another sip of his now cold coffee, as if needing a moment to collect himself before continuing. The cluster of trees he was pointing at was a dense area of tall pine trees. They've been long gone by now. But back then, there wasn't much in the way of illumination out there. But even I could see there was nothing there. I stood there, the pizza still clutched in my hand, as I waited for anything to happen. But nothing emerged from the woods. Harlan's voice grew even quieter, forcing us to lean in to hear him. I was just about to turn back to Derek when I heard get out from beside me in a hushed voice, clear as could be. I turned around immediately to look at Derek, and without saying a word, I knew he'd heard it too. A chill ran through me as Harlan spoke those words. I could almost hear that ghostly whisper myself, carried on the night wind. But while it was creepy as could be, I didn't know for sure what it meant, Harlan continued. It didn't come out as an ominous command more like a warning. But I won't lie. Standing there outside, I'd never felt fear like that before. I'd been afraid before, and I'd been afraid after, but not like that. That fear was less like a feeling, and more like a part of your body, like it's always there, and only rarely are you truly aware of it. As Harlan spoke, his eyes seemed to look beyond us, beyond the warm, cozy ranger station, back to that cold November night 30 years ago. The fire crackled in the hearth, casting dancing shadows on the walls, and for a moment, those shadows seemed to take on sinister shapes. I couldn't have told you how much time passed, Harlan said, his voice distant. May have only been a minute or two, but despite the dwindling light, I thought I could see shapes moving far out in the woods, very far out. After a moment, you couldn't see anything at all. He paused, his brow furrowed as if trying to make sense of a particularly puzzling memory. To this day, I have no idea why that sight filled me with so much fear, he said.
his voice barely above a whisper. Just like I also have no idea how I knew it was people. But I did. And I knew it was people, as in more than one. Much more than one. But I had no idea exactly how many. The silence in the room was thick enough to cut with a knife. We were all leaning forward, hanging on Harlan's every word. The comfortable warmth of the ranger station seemed to have vanished, replaced by a chill that had nothing to do with the temperature outside. Then, almost as if on cue, I heard the word now, Harlan said, and it was all the motivation I needed to tell Derek we had to go. He didn't need to be told twice because we hopped in his car and got out of there as fast as we could. Didn't stop for about 20 miles, and we were far away from the ranger station. He let out a small, humorless chuckle. By that point, the fear had slowly faded and I was starving, so we split the pizza while debating what to tell my superiors. I eventually decided to say that I was feeling really sick and went to see a doctor I knew. Harlan shook his head, a rueful smile on his face. But it didn't take long for me to realize my excuse for leaving would be completely forgotten. Because after I left, the ranger station had been broken into by a group of people. My eyes widened at this revelation, and I saw similar looks of shock on Anthony and Craig's faces. We all knew about break-ins and vandalism in the park, but this felt different, more personal somehow. The security camera we had at the time saw all six of them, dressed from head to toe in black, break right through the front door, Harlan continued, just crashed right through it. Then, minutes later, they came back out without taking anything and vanished into the trees. The cops thoroughly searched the area but found nothing. He leaned back in his chair, his eyes distant. I found out when I called my superiors to tell them I had to leave because I was feeling horrible. From the time on the camera, they appeared to arrive within mere minutes after I left with Derek. We all exchanged looks as the full weight of what Harland was saying sank in. This wasn't just a story about something that happened in the park. This had happened right here, in this very ranger station where we now sat. Harlan didn't say anything for a moment, but he could clearly see the effect his words were having on us. The ranger station, which had always felt like a safe haven, suddenly seemed different. The shadows in the corners seemed deeper, the creaking of the old wood more ominous. The conclusion the cops reached, Harland eventually said, breaking the tense silence, is that it was a gang of professional criminals who saw the ranger station and decided to see what they could find. Since there was apparently nothing they could make use of, they split. He paused, his eyes sweeping over each of us in turn. And every year on that day since that happened, I've taken a single flower and left it by where Derek says he saw someone that night. I've never seen or heard that voice since that night, but on occasion I felt the presence of something or someone watching me and not in an unpleasant way. Harlan's voice took on a thoughtful tone. But that's the thing about the woods. There's no telling what you may find in them. And if you're really paying attention, it's amazing what you can learn. Like I learned that November night all those years ago was a full moon. The clouds just happened to obscure it out here. As Harland finished his story, a heavy silence fell over the room. The fire crackled in the hearth, casting flickering shadows on the walls. Outside, the wind had picked up, rustling through the trees and creating eerie whispers that seemed to echo Harland's tale. I found myself looking at the ranger station with new eyes. The comfortable, familiar space now held an air of mystery, Every creak of the old wood, every shadow in the corners, seemed to hold the potential for something. More. Anthony was the first to break the silence. Harland, he said, his voice slightly shaky, do you think, do you think it was really the witch? From the story? Harland shook his head slowly. I can't say for sure, Anthony. What I can say is that there are things in these woods that defy easy explanation. Whether it's a witch, or spirits, or just the wild nature of the forest itself, who can say? Craig leaned forward, his face pale in the firelight. But the voice, the people in the woods, what do you think they were? I've asked myself that question a thousand times over the years, 
Harland replied. Sometimes I think it was just my imagination, fueled by old stories and a dark, rainy night. Other times, he trailed off, his eyes distant. Other times, I'm not so sure. I found myself speaking up, my voice sounding strange to my own ears. Do you ever feel unsafe out here after what happened? Harlan turned to me, a small smile on his weathered face. No, not unsafe. Cautious, maybe. More aware. These woods, they're not good or evil. They just are. They have their own rules, their own way of being. Our job isn't to understand it all, but to respect it. To listen when the woods speak, even if we don't always understand what they're saying. He stood up, stretching his back. That's enough ghost stories for one night, I think. We've still got a job to do, after all. As if on cue, the radio on the desk crackled to life, breaking the spell that had fallen over us. It was just a routine check-in from another ranger, but it served to remind us of the world beyond our fireside circle. We all stood up, shaking off the lingering effects of Harlan's story. But as I moved to check the monitors, I couldn't help but glance out the window into the dark woods beyond. For a moment I thought I saw something move among the trees, a flash of white, like a woman's dress. But when I blinked and looked again, there was nothing there but shadows and leaves. I turned back to my tasks, but Harlan's words echoed in my mind. The woods have their own rules, their own way of being. And as I settled in for the rest of my shift, I found myself listening more closely to the whispers of the wind, the creaking of the trees, wondering what secrets they might hold. From that night on, every time I walked through the woods, every time I heard an unexplained sound or felt an unexpected chill, I remembered Harlan's story, and I remembered to listen, to pay attention, because out here in the wild heart of the forest, you never know what you might learn or what might be listening back. It all began on a crisp autumn morning two years ago. The four of us, myself, Tom, Rachel, and Chris, had been friends since college, bonded by our shared love for the outdoors. We'd been on numerous camping trips together, but this time we were aiming for something grander, a week-long expedition to Yellowstone National Park. The planning phase was exciting. We spent countless evenings huddled around my dining room table, poring over maps, guidebooks, and online forums. Tom, always the organizer, created a detailed spreadsheet of our itinerary, gear list, and budget. Rachel, our resident biologist, was particularly thrilled about the prospect of seeing the park's diverse wildlife. Chris, the adventurous one, kept pushing for us to explore some of the less traveled areas of the park. As for me, I was just happy to be going on this trip with my closest friends. Life had been hectic lately with work and family commitments, and I was looking forward to disconnecting from the digital world and reconnecting with nature. We decided to drive from our hometown in Colorado, making it a road trip within a trip. The journey itself was memorable, filled with sing-alongs to 80s rock ballads, heated debates about the best trail mix combinations, and stops at quirky roadside attractions. Arriving at Yellowstone was like entering another world. The sheer scale of the place was overwhelming. We entered through the east entrance, and almost immediately we spotted a herd of bison grazing peacefully near the road. Rachel was in her element, rattling off facts about the animal's behavior and the park's ecosystem. Our first couple of days went exactly as planned. We set up camp at Bridge Bay Campground, which would serve as our base for exploring the southern part of the park. The campground was bustling with other visitors, creating a festive atmosphere. We spent our evenings exchanging stories with fellow campers from all over the world. During the day, we hit all the major attractions. Old Faithful was as impressive as we'd imagined, erupting with clockwork precision. The Grand Prismatic Spring left us in awe with its otherworldly colors. We hiked around the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, marveling at the thunderous waterfalls and the golden hues of the canyon walls. But it wasn't all sightseeing. 
We also had our share of small adventures. On our third day while hiking near Mud Volcano, we had a close encounter with a young grizzly bear. We remembered our wilderness training, stay calm, make noise, and slowly back away. The bear seemed more curious than aggressive, and after a tense few minutes, it ambled off into the bushes. The experience left us exhilarated, but also more cautious. As we moved into the second half of our trip, we decided to be more spontaneous. We left Bridge Bay and headed north, planning to find campsites as we went along. This decision would lead us to the unforgettable events that would conclude our trip. We spent a day exploring the Lamar Valley, often called America's Serengeti due to its abundant wildlife. We saw wolves in the distance, watched playful river otters, and even spotted a majestic elk. The vastness of the valley with its sweeping vistas and diverse ecosystems made us feel small in the grand scheme of nature. That night we camped at Slough Creek Campground. The stars were incredible, with the Milky Way stretching across the sky in a dazzling display. We stayed up late, identifying constellations and sharing our hopes and dreams for the future. The next day we decided to venture off the beaten path a bit. Chris had heard about some lesser known geothermal features in a more remote area of the park. We spent the day hiking, marveling at bubbling mud pots and steaming fumaroles that few tourists ever see. As evening approached, we realized we had strayed quite far from any designated campgrounds. We weren't worried at first. We had our gear, and backcountry camping is allowed in Yellowstone with proper permits, which we had obtained as a precaution. However, as darkness fell, an uneasy feeling began to settle over us. The landscape seemed different in the twilight, less welcoming. We drove for what felt like hours, looking for a suitable place to camp or a way back to more populated areas. It was well past midnight when we finally came across a clearing that looked like it had been used for camping before. There were a few stone fire rings scattered around and the ground was relatively flat. Exhausted and out of options, we decided to set up camp there. Setting up the tent in the dark was a challenge. We worked by the light of our headlamps and the car's headlights, our shadows dancing eerily on the surrounding trees. The usual banter and joking that accompanied our camp setups was absent, replaced by a tense silence broken only by necessary communication. Too tired to cook or even chat, we crawled into our sleeping bags almost immediately. The night was unusually quiet. No crickets chirping, no rustling of small animals in the underbrush. In retrospect, this silence should have been our first warning. I'm not sure how long I slept before I was shaken awake. Tom's face loomed over me, his expression a mix of confusion and fear. Listen, he whispered urgently. At first I heard nothing unusual. Then, as my senses sharpened, I noticed it. Bird calls, lots of them, coming from all directions. This might not seem strange except for two things. It was the middle of the night, hours away from dawn, and the calls didn't sound quite right. We woke Rachel and Chris, and all huddled in the tent, straining our ears. The bird sounds were varied. Some sounded like owls, others like songbirds, but the timing and rhythm were off. They seemed to be coming closer, then receding, almost like signals. Rachel, with her biology background, was the first to verbalize what we were all thinking. Those aren't birds at least not all of them. The realization sent a chill down my spine. If they weren't birds, what were they? And more importantly, who was making these sounds? We decided to investigate, more out of a need to do something than any real hope of understanding what was happening. Quietly, we unzipped the tent and stepped out into the clearing. The night was clear and cold, the moon casting an ethereal glow over the landscape. We huddled next to our car, using it as a shield and a potential quick escape. The bird calls had stopped as soon as we exited the tent, leaving an eerie silence in their wake. We stood there for what felt like hours, but was probably only a few minutes, our eyes straining to penetrate the darkness at the edge of the clearing. That's when we saw them. Movements in the shadows, just at the tree line. At first I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, 
But then I heard Chris's sharp intake of breath and knew he had seen it too. The shapes were humanoid but moved with an unnatural fluidity. They seemed to flit from tree to tree, always just at the edge of visibility. I couldn't make out any details, but the wrongness of their movement made my heart race. We didn't need to discuss our next move. As if triggered by some unspoken signal, we all scrambled for the car doors. I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking so badly I could barely get them into the ignition. As the engine roared to life and the headlights illuminated the clearing, we saw them clearly for the first time. Two figures stood at the edge of the woods, and the sight of them is forever etched in my memory. They were human in shape, but that's where the similarity ended. Their bodies were gaunt, almost skeletal, and covered in what looked like layers of mud and leaves. But it was their eyes that truly terrified me. They reflected the light like an animal's, glowing an eerie yellow in the beam of the headlights. I slammed the car into reverse, then drive, and we tore out of the clearing as fast as we dared on the rough road. In the rearview mirror, I caught a glimpse of more figures emerging from the woods, moving with that same unsettling grace. We drove through the night, not daring to stop until we reached a main road. As the first light of dawn broke, we found ourselves at the park's west entrance. We were safe, but shaken to our core. We reported our experience to the park rangers, who listened politely but skeptically. They assured us they would investigate, but warned us that many things could look strange in the dark woods at night. We knew what we had seen was more than a trick of the light or an overactive imagination. But we also knew how unbelievable our story sounded. The experience changed us, both individually and as a group. Tom became obsessed with researching unexplained phenomena in national parks. Rachel threw herself into studying nocturnal animals and their behaviors, as if trying to find a scientific explanation for what we had encountered. Chris, ironically, became more cautious in his adventures, always making sure to stay on marked trails and populated areas. As for me, I found myself torn between wanting to forget the whole experience and needing to understand it. I've returned to Yellowstone twice since then, trying to retrace our steps and find that clearing. I never could, and part of me is relieved about that. We still get together regularly, the four of us, but our camping trips are less frequent and always to well-populated, well-lit campgrounds. We've tried to make sense of what happened that night, coming up with theories ranging from the plausible, an unknown indigenous tribe or a group of extreme survivalists, to the fantastic, supernatural beings or some kind of government experiment. The truth is, we'll probably never know exactly what we encountered in that remote corner of Yellowstone, but the experience taught us a valuable lesson about respecting the unknown and the importance of staying vigilant, even in seemingly safe environments. Yellowstone remains a place of incredible beauty and wonder, but for us, it also holds a mystery that continues to haunt our dreams and fuel our conversations. It's a reminder that even in our modern, mapped, and GPS-tracked world, there are still mysteries out there, waiting in the dark corners of the wilderness.